We are live. All right. Hello and welcome to our 11th Trust Meetup. And there are my slides. Hi. All right. Now, now it's going. All right, folks. Hey, hello and welcome to our 11th Trust Meetup. It's, it's number 11 already and I almost can't believe it. So it's, it's been almost a year since we are doing that. Um, and yeah, so, so thanks for, for being with us and thanks for, uh, for being with us so late. So it's, it's usually, um, Usually we start around 5:30. Now it's 10 p.m. Um, well, at least here in Europe, uh, I don't know where you're look, where you're joining from. Um, anyway, great that you're here. There you go. All right. So um, this meetup, as always, is brought to you by the Coding Group Linz, uh, and thanks for the Coding Group Linz to for helping us uh, uh, in organizing this meetup. I want to introduce you to today's speakers. So first up, so first of all, we have two speakers where I really look forward to, to meeting them and, and seeing them speak because I've seen the work uh, previously and then they do fantastic things. So I can't wait to see the talks here live on, on the Rust Link stage. Um, first up will be Tim McNamara um, on how to learn Rust. So Tim um, is uh, tweeting under Tim Clicks and is the author of Rust in Action. Uh, which has been sent to the printer today, I guess. So I just received an email that uh, I'm going to receive my copy in a couple of weeks, I presume. Um, next up is JT, um, who is the creator of, of New Shell, and they will talk about New Shell and the new path for your shell. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I, I love this picture with the little fairy doll in, in the corner. And yeah, so if you want to join us, if you want to chat with us, please join our Discord. Um, this is our Discord uh, link. You can join for free, and I'm going to post it to um, the YouTube stream as well. Um, and let's go on with some community news. So uh, the Code of Dojo Linz is happening again. The next virtual meeting is tomorrow, uh, and I guess then two in in two weeks. So every every other week. In fact, uh, we do it every week. You do it every week? Every week. Every week we have programming <laughs> classes for, for kids on Friday afternoon. Yes, that's correct. Cool. Um, so, yeah, that's the coding group. Linz, the code of Linz uh, for people from age 8 to 17. So what, what are we going to expect at the code of Linz? Tomorrow? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Tomorrow we have a workshop about uh, virtual electronics tinkering. So uh, if kids are interested in doing some soldering together with our mentors and things like that, that will be very exciting. I myself will do an intro workshops with TypeScript. We will do some, cre uh, some creative coding where we build TypeScript games. Uh, what else do we have? We have another web development office hour where Karin, another mentor of the Code Dojo, is available for the kids who do their their own projects and who want to ask questions. And finally, we will have a Java introduction workshops for kids who have already a little bit of coding experience and who want to build Flappy Birds in Java cool. to enhance their Java skills. Cool. Wow. That sounds fun. All right. Um, next up, next week, um, and I, I think I got it right. It's it's going to be an in-person meeting of our local female coders uh, study group. So they meet at the Wissensturm in the Kärntner Straße. Um, that's what what the website says. Um, it's a study group for all people who who consider them females, um, and uh, you get all the information about the study group meetings at female-coders.at. Um, and last but not least, next week on Tuesday, um, the Cloud Native Computing Linz Meetup. It, I guess it's the other meetup that has been founded in Linz during the pandemic, um, is having their fifth outing, if I'm not mistaken, um, via Zoom. So if you are into Cloud Native Computing, um, be sure to join them. All right. Um, also, um, so th those were, were news from, from Linz and around. I also want to point out that RustConf is happening again, um, uh, virtual again, on September 14. And the call for papers, or call for proposals is still open until July 11. So if you have um, an idea for a 30-minute talk, 50-minute talk, or five-minute talk, um, they are gathering proposals right now. Um, and yeah, so uh, if, you, if you have an idea, be sure to... Uh, submit the proposal. 
And with that, I want to uh, say a little word about our sponsors. So we are very grateful that Microsoft is, is sponsoring uh, the Rust Linz Meetup again. Uh, this helps us a lot. Thank you very much for your support. Um, if you uh, want to check out free online workshops for all things Azure and the cloud, uh, go to aka.ms discover Austria Azure. Um, there you find uh, free online workshops, tutorials, and guides on how to get started with Azure. Um, and uh, Microsoft in Austria also has a, a podcast uh, called the Azure Dev Talks. Uh, Rainer was already a guest, uh, and so were a couple of other folks from from Austria, from the from the community here in Austria. Um, it's it's a video podcast, if I'm not mistaken on several topics. So um, yeah, be sure to check that out as well. Anything I forgot? I don't think so. I would like to thank you, Stefan, for this great idea for doing the Rust <laughs> Meetup at 10 p.m. In the, in the evening so that we can really invite some, some guys from the other end of the globe. And I'm looking forward to two very interesting hours. Yeah, so, so I, I did it for, for two reasons. First of all, um, I wanted to have JT and Tim um, at our meetup for a long, long time. So I guess we were in contact with JT oh, in, in, in February or March already uh, when, when, when you figured out, oh, wow, um, that's actually a big time difference. So they're basically on the other end of the world and it's 8 a.m. Uh, uh, over there right now. Um, they, have, they have people from the future because it's already Friday. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and and the other reason was um, so usually I, I'm I'm here at the start helping you out a little bit and then I try to get my both my kids into bed so I, I miss out about half of, of each each meetup uh, and this gives me an opportunity to MC a meetup again um, to to um, do the Q and A to do the moderation I can feel a every day. But uh, I have to practice a lot, lot more now. But anyway, that's 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 uh, a couple of reasons why we why we have the meetup so late right now. Um, let's not waste any more minutes. Let's hand over to our first speaker. I want to introduce Tim, pressing the right button. Hello, Tim. Hi. Hello, Tim. Schönen Hi, Tim. Abend. How's it going? Uh, it's really good. Uh, it's actually uh, a, a mild winter here um in new zealand <laughs> oh, well, I, um, I, we, we we have a little bit of a storm uh brewing so hopefully it won't come over too badly on the microphone oh, wow. but um i'm uh i'm looking forward to, to this evening's talk cool congratulations on your book so i was very happy when i received the mail today that i'm, I'm going to get my copy in a couple of weeks so that's that's, that's pretty right. great that's quite an achievement the uh, I know a lot of people have been waiting for a long time for Rust in Action to be published. The publication date has re been repeatedly pushed out further and further and further. I um, have been waiting longer than you. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. So um, this has been a five-year project for me. Um, oh. I probably put mm -hmm. in about two and a half thousand hours um, into the project um sort of 10 hours a week for nearly five years and wow. so uh yeah it's it's i'm i'm extremely excited to see uh this thing finished it's going to be great absolutely absolutely and it's going to be a big book so about 500 pages that's uh well it's it 450 so. okay <laughs> but still, so right. so that's going so, to be awesome yeah so rust in action i don't um uh, I'm not here to sell the book, but um, if people are interested, it the reason it's so challenging, there's two reasons, really. One is that it teaches you systems programming as well as Rust. So uh, my view when I started the project was that a lot of people were coming to Rust from JavaScript or Python or, uh, you know, whatever other language. And then they were encountering a community that had an understanding for what pointers meant, for what memory safety was, and that felt very unfamiliar. And so I wanted a resource that uh, that people could uh, use to understand those terms and concepts. Um, and the other thing is that uh, every chapter has a large project. And uh, unfortunately, with software, um, software has bugs. And so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's taken a lot of editing to, to get everything right. Gotcha. 
But hey, there it is. So let's, ja, ja, let's ja. celebrate. Also, in, ja, ich, ähm, danke für die Gelegenheit, ähm, hier zu sprechen. Ähm, ja, ich danke mich. Cool, great. Right, that's, that's live now. That's on tape. <laughs> Very good. Okay, all right. So uh, I think without further ado, let's, let's start with your presentation. So Tim, uh, welcome to our meetup. Uh, the stage is yours. Wunderbar. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to learning how to learn Rust. I uh, uh, I decided to talk about this uh, from the point of view of a an individual who is intimidated by this language that they keep hearing is too big to learn and is difficult. And I don't think that's uh, that's necessarily true. Um, my my view is that you should start small and just start with a small part of the language and then grow that over time. This talk will be uh, a demonstration of one strategy or for, for doing so. So that's basically the entire talk. <laughs> you know, if you're only here for two, two minutes, um, that, is, that is the main message. Uh, so just a very small introduction uh, to me. Uh, I've been a programmer for, more, for about 15 years now. Um, my academic credentials are in the humanities, though. Uh, I'm not a computer science major. Uh, as we've spoken about, we've, I've just published the Rust in Action book. I'm also the organizer of our local meetup group, Rust Wellington. Um, so there's um, a little bit of the cover. Uh, so about this talk, um, its aims are to provide you confidence. It's 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 number one aim is to give you enough confidence to read the rest of the material it, i can't teach you all of rust today unfortunately uh, and secondly to provide you though with a strategy for learning for some small core of rust that can be used to make practical projects and then you can expand that knowledge as you gain confidence uh, so the structure of the talk will be quite loose we will be going through code examples and then i will uh, add some personal thoughts and just a, a very small warning. Um, some of those thoughts will probably be conf <laughs> uh, will probably be incorrect um, and 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 maybe even controversial. So um, we'll see what JT thinks of, <laughs> of some of the things that I have to say. Okay, so um, just my belief is that uh, uh, in in terms of Rust is that Rust is centered around two main things. One is uh, this notion of a trait, and the other one is safe access to data. So if you can understand those two concepts, I think you'll understand the majority of Rust. Uh, and so I would focus on structs, vectors, or sort of like vectors of structs, uh, iteration, so how to like process that data within a vector, result and option. Those types uh, are how we express error or missing values uh, inside of Rust programming. And if you can focus on that core of the language, my argument is that actually that will provide you the foundation to learn the rest. Everything else can wait. Okay, so let's learn Rust in small pieces. Um, that means working with examples that provide immediate feedback. When you get the compiler to work, you get this kind of very small release of dopamine, and that's actually very positive from a learning point of view because it provides you with some encouragement to continue. And as you expand, oh, sorry, as you as the compiler uh, works for you uh, and it compiles, you can then expand and, 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 and move forward. So the first question is like, where do I start with Rust? And then we've got Hallo Linz. That's great. So we can print to the screen. That's probably the first thing that we do. And then we get this output, Hallo Linz. And then our next question is, well, how do I use a variable in Rust? And so uh, we have our variable here name or Nama, uh, if we're <laughs> speaking German, and then and we can uh, expand our example. And uh, now we've got some intuition about what a variable looks like in, in, in Rust. And then it's like, okay, so how do I create my own type? Um, and that we create a struct definition with, with a name in there. Uh, and then we also learn about, uh, as we go through, a syntax for defining a structure where we have this kind of literal syntax within curly braces and uh, we put the name in here. And then we can uh, field access. Um, we can we use, use the dot operator to access a field, which is, relates to this string over here. Um, and this all seems like it will work. And then sadly it will not. And so 
the very <laughs> one of the very first things that you will encounter as a beginner Rust programmer is this distinction between a string and ampersand stir. Luckily, Rust actually provides a helper method, or sorry, like some help uh, along with its compiler error. It's like, well, why don't you try using two string? Uh, and right now, as a beginner Rust programmer, you don't need to know why that is important. <laughs> uh, but um, what I want you to uh, remember is that even these very simple examples uh, require uh, provide like there is actually quite a lot of complexity uh, in uh, it going on here with types and with uh, new syntax. And if you have not programmed before, if Rust is your first programming language, it's okay to go slow. Uh, we will actually describe. Um, so, so we we apply um, this method, uh, and then we get the correct or the desired output. Now, our uh, the next question is, okay, so what is the difference between a string and an ampersand stir? So, ampersand stir is actually normally pronounced as a string slice, uh, and we will understand the reasons as we um, or understand that distinction. Um, as we as we develop our understanding but remember what i said about right now we're just learning the core and we will expand our knowledge over time so the first the next thing that i want to know is I, this syntax here seems kind of ugly um, i would like to understand what constructors are and so uh, i introduce i kind of do some reading and i find discover this impool block and i can add my own um, methods or in fact in this case it's a it's a static method method uh, where I take an ampersand stir and then I call to string um, inside new and get the same result which is hello lens and we're growing our language over time with small examples and then the question is okay well I really I'm doing some more research and I want to understand how to accept either a string or a string slice <laughs> and so then uh, I might encounter some example on a blog post with some syntax that's more ugly, or at least it's 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 difficult. Um, so the first thing to note is we have uh, changed the type that our name is accepting from a specific type to a generic type, uh, and we are asking Rust to provide uh, to accept any type t that can. Uh, be represented as a stir, wait, as a string, slice. <laughs> actually, it's not not capital S, like a little little s, uh, str, um, via an as ref method, which sounds a bit strange at first. Uh, but what this means is that we can take a reference to our object name, and that will be represented as a string slice. And then, because we know at this point here. Uh, that we have a string slice. String slice methods do have a two string method and which we've already used twice before. And so that can allow us to accept either um, either argument. Now, if you are a an experienced Rust programmer, you will know that this is like a very unsatisfactory, <laughs> this is an unsatisfactory um, way to get what um, to, uh, achieve the outcome that we that we want we incur we another um, we incur another allocation a memory allocation here and my argument will be that um, when you're learning the extra 20 nanoseconds that you will incur via that memory allocation is, a, is an acceptable loss um, okay and so we want so we're continuing to expand our example. And what we want to now do is replace this print line statement here. Um, or I don't want to reveal the internals of name. I just want to be able to print a greeting. Uh, so how do I ask it to print itself? And it turns out that uh, I've got, um, this is what we had before, and this here is new. So I can implement or bring in, I learn a little bit about bringing in other libraries. And I can implement a trait display or format display for greeting my custom type. And then all I, I say all I need to do. And then 
uh, I can copy the example that's in the documentation almost word for word and change some of the name uh, variables and so forth. And then greeting is able to print itself. Uh, it's able to be accepted by the print um, by the by this kind of special syntax within signed uh, within signed the print line macro. Okay, cool. We've we've gone through a little bit of the strategy of how to grow the language over time. You want to use uh, small examples and and grow them. So I but I but I do want to. Uh, give you permission to uh, be confused <laughs> because Rust can be confusing. Um, for example, this is the implementation taken directly from the, well, it's actually, I've added some syntax, I've added some spacing to, <laughs> because it's so small, uh, for the uh, standard memory drop method, uh, sorry, function. Now, unlike our custom type before, so we'll start here, we'll start with the T. Uh, it accepts every type. Now, uh, interestingly, we have a uh, an underscore or a prefix for our variable x, and that prefix of the underscore provides an indication to you. It's like a convention within the Rust community that uh, we don't actually make use of that argument. Uh, and then it turns out, though, that... Uh, to understand what this function is doing, you need to understand how Rust uh, Rust ownership system. And so, what this syntax here does, we take a, the uh, underscore x by value, and that puts the uh, that moves ownership of uh, underscore t into uh, the drop scope. And when drop scope becomes uh, when this drops when the scope ends. Uh, underscore t will be uh, freed up or deleted. Now, uh, if you don't know enough about Rust, it can be very, very confusing. And a good sign that you are learning Rust is being able to understand the drop function. Like, uh, if you can, uh, if you if you have an intuitive understanding of what is happening here, that means it's very likely that you are you are learning Rust. Uh, another one that confused me was the what the so-called entry API. Uh, so this is a if we a hash map. So this might be um, a, a JavaScript object or a Python dictionary. Uh, I'm just introducing a little bit of more some more syntax. So um, for every character in the string slice, um, uh, via uh, so I can return an iterator of um, of the string slice um, character by character. Uh, I want to add in the current, so I've got this entry method in letters, and if uh, either insert, oh sorry, either retrieve the the count that already exists, if it or uh, otherwise start with zero, and then this syntax here with the star really confused me because when I started with Rust, I had only used Python and I didn't really understand um, pointers. Um, this counter. Is a mutable reference to uh, what is inside the value inside this this hash map, and so we can ask Rust with the dereference operator, which happens to be a star, that it should increment that number. Uh, and again, this is another case where if um, it probably looks intimidating and uh, strange at first, but if you are learning it, um, if you if you find yourself understanding what is happening here, it's a good sign that you are, are learning Rust, and it's that's to be congratulated. And the other one I think is um, well, the other, the other uh, is <clears throat> another example from the standard library of something that I originally found very very strange um, <laughs> was all of this um, uh, was was the implementation of the of a conversion. Um, of the of of like the, this conversion trait from oh sorry oh, actually we're we're implementing into on the basis of from and saying for every type t so we're actually talking only about t and we can convert it into type u so for every type t if u implements from of t then t into u also works and it's defined um, by its inverse and so if you 
are becoming, this is another sign where it's okay to be confused at the, at the start. And as you, your Rust knowledge is grow, grows, then, uh, then syntax like this will start to be less unclear, at least, and hopefully over time actually um, understandable. Right. Okay. As you learn Rust, uh, there will be parts of uh, the uh, parts of your learning journey that uh, will be difficult. And um, so my view is that um, you should try to be realistic with the amount of learning that the amount of new new things that you can learn at any one time. It's okay to sit to like walk your own path. It's okay to go slow. Um, Rust is different. It's ownership. It, it has a very helpful compiler, but its compiler is very strict and it's very pedantic. And so um, try to uh, try to make sure that you're kind of in the right mindset. Um, one of the things that I think um, that you may wish to consider is like, why are you learning Rust? Um, and we're in the situation now where Rust is very, very trendy. Um, and I don't think that that motivation or you know, being scared or you know worried about missing out is a an effective way or is likely to be an effective way for you to learn um, over time. And so potentially I would encourage you to switch that to like, what are, what are some things that the Rust language can offer me that, um, that other languages cannot? And the emphasis on safe access to memory is, um, and high, is, is very valuable, whichever language that you're using. Um, now, deliberate practice is the most effective way to learn. And that means that uh, setting aside time and being deliberate is, is, if, is really important. Your local Rust community, Rust Linz, for example, for those um, in Austria, um, seems to be doing a fantastic job. And uh, I recommend joining the Discord uh, servers, either um, particularly smaller servers as well, or finding a group online that you can connect to and ask questions with. Smaller servers or uh, smaller communities are often easier to ask sillier questions. And I personally recommend sharing things you learn as you learn them, because that actually, you know, as well as teaching others, that actually helps you learn as well. Now, uh, just kind of some more um, slightly philosophical um, parts. So I think that you should give yourself permission to fail. Um, learning Rust involves new concepts, new syntax, and new jargon. There's a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot that might be alien to your brain and you need to give your time, uh, your, you need to give your brain some time to learn. Um, and it's okay even to be intimidated. Rust, the Rust community tends to attract people who are very skilled and uh, that has a negative effect to newcomers or to people who feel that they have less expertise. Uh, as it happens, everyone, almost everyone feels this experience that everybody else in the room is more qualified than they are. And so um, as much as you can, try to give yourself, uh, try to forgive yourself. If you encounter this, this kind of phenomenon inside your brain, um, your brain is lying to you. You are welcome here. The Rust community is your place too. You have a seat at the table. And uh, um, yeah, your brain is lying to you. <laughs> Uh, from a sort of slightly more technical note, I've already mentioned this very slightly. Um, when you're starting, especially, it's okay to use inefficient methods like clone and two string. If the borrow checker is, um, if you don't, if the borrow checker is difficult, or you don't understand why the compiler is complaining to you, uh, then it's okay to give yourself some more time to learn. Um, and the other one, and this is like, I think quite important, <laughs> but if, if you're from C sharp or Java, 
um, it's very easy to write. Um, you, people might laugh at you for writing Java or C Sharp in Rust. And I want you to know that I'm just going to get all of these through. Um, that it's okay to write Java in Rust while you are learning Rust. There is plenty of time to learn idiomatic. Uh, um, so idiomatic Rust is is very functional in in, in its approach. It like, prefers higher order programming and it prefers. Uh, um, I find really really elegant. Um, abstraction and if you are the kind of person who likes to create a uh, an index variable i that starts at zero and then increment that um, that very that the index um, over time then start there because uh, i guarantee you that in three months time that will change but right now what's important is uh is your own learning journey don't learn more than the minimum required for the next step um, and and uh right and uh, one one thing just just very uh, that i'd like to point out is that only a minority of rust's programming community speaks english as a first language um, and uh rust uses terminology that's very confusing and is you would not uh, for example borrowing doesn't not involve it doesn't relate very well to the concept of say borrowing someone's uh like borrowing someone's screwdriver or like hammer uh because it turns out that you can have multiple borrows uh like read only access to um put, to data type and that is something that where there's a mismatch between the analogy and the rust compiler likewise ownership means in ownership in rust means something that's very different than ownership in terms of property rights property rights mean that you have the power to exclude everybody else from uh your property but in rust ownership is related specifically uh, to uh having the responsibility of destroying that value when drop was implemented with just an empty block Drop had the response. Uh, Drop had ownership of that value, and that's what enabled, um, indicated to the compiler that when Drop scope finished, it should be freed up. Lifetimes are another uh, sort of slightly strange concept. The uh, um, and our uh, our plain English, or you know, the dictionary definition does not stretch very far um, into a new programming language, and. Uh, um, like even things like references and smart pointers, all of this jargon can be confusing. And so, uh, again, give yourself permission to go slow. Um, there is plenty of time in the future. Ah, okay. <laughs> and likewise, when you are um, uh, going, I'm actually going to speed through this a little bit just because I just realized that I am uh, sort of at 20 minutes now. But I would encourage you at some stage to um, practice uh, reading at first uh, more complicated examples. Uh, there are some very, very good Rust code ar around and try and develop an intuition for what's actually happening here. So in this case, we are connecting to a web server. Um, we're creating an HTTP 1.0 request um, and, the, uh, and copying the output directly to standard out. And, uh, the other thing to note is that um, there are more, there's more than one way to achieve a particular outcome. In this case, we're looking for um, this octal value of 204, which happens to be 132 in decimal. Uh, and we could look through it by incrementing through the haystack. And then uh, if the, uh, and we receive a, a reference to item here, and then um, if it matches our needle, then uh, which is um, 132 well then we print it out um, otherwise we could do something slightly different which is use the contains method either way is fine especially while you are learning because what's important is that you get the compiler to to accept your code <laughs> um, right now and 
actually, um, I just want to say that even with a very small amount of rust, you can um, you can do some things that are quite interesting. So uh, we talked about structures and and iterators. So we've got this. Um, we've got some uh, a text. Well, we've got a string slice of um, New Zealand penguin um, data. So these are three species of penguin. Um, the little penguin actually is, you know, um, nests about 15 kilometers away from where I am now. And um, we take every line, we iterate through those records. And so this is a CSV. Um, and just take a note of the things that you don't yet understand. So here's some new syntax. We've got a vector and we um, use, are using an underscore as a placeholder. And uh, we're splitting on, on commas. So that's um, these points here. So we now have um, two, uh, we now have tuples, and then we trim all white space and then collect. A collect is doing something magical by taking all of our iterators and, and collecting them into one vector. Um, one thing to, to note as well is, is this parse method. I used to find this very, very magical, but it turns out that um, uh, we give a little bit of a, we give a type hint to Rust, and it is actually able to inspect the string and say, okay, I know that you want a floating point number from let's say 65. I know what that means to, and um, and I will try to apply the conversion. And if it fails, skip the record. Um, uh, if you if you slowly, oh, sorry, not slowly. If you build up from small examples and uh, decide that. Um, if you build up from small examples, you'll be able to take on more and more complex programs um, quite quickly, I find. Okay, again, smart faults grow gradually. Um, my view is that Rust is centered around traits and access to data. And so start with structs, vectors, and iteration. <laughs> I also uh, just uh, the, would also include result and option in there as well, and everything else can wait or come next. And um, um, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. That was a fantastic, a fantastic talk. So um, there are no questions, but there are a couple of comments. Okay. Uh, which I, which I, I'm absolutely agreeing with. So, so Kushikim, I don't know if I, if I pronounced the name correctly or if I just butchered it. Um, said uh okay to use clone that statement alone makes this talk worth for me uh, and that's that's absolutely right so so you struggle so much with with memory in the beginning um and it's totally okay to just let it go and and just try to solve to solve your problem um but but maybe build up on that um I learned Rust mainly through doing exorcism courses, which is great because you have the small little little tasks. You have unit tests where you can validate um, what you have done. You have stretch goals if you want to go the extra mile. You have you have a couple of more uh, things to do. Um, and I guess at around exercise 40 of, of about 99, it, it suddenly clicked, you know, it, it suddenly... Um, I, um, I was stuck with a, with a problem that performed really, really bad. Mm. And I tried to reflect it to to make it efficient and to make uh, make memory uh, management more efficient. And I guess that the biggest problem was um, getting finding the min and max of a hash map key and okay. using it back as an index again. Right. So this was a lot of a lot of uh, um, I, I can't call, in, call yeah. it pointer arithmetics, but you you sure. needed to know what what to own means and and mm. uh, how to get the values out of that, um, and that was the one point where it really clicked for me. And uh, I wonder if there's a way to to train people to get to this point. Uh, um, well, I think exorcism in particular is a very nice program because there is mentoring in there as well. Uh, you. Um, now I have struggled over the last year or so trying to identify like minimum viable rust, uh, <laughs> you know, and how like is there a set is there a is there a path where we can take people who are very um, are familiar with just copying things around, you know, if you are a Python programmer, you have never had to worry about 
whether or not something is a memory allocation or not um because everything is a memory allocation and <laughs> the uh and trying to find some um well actually there is one one problem with say writing a book or uh is that no one resource is going to be appropriate for everybody uh and that's one of the reasons why i am actually very excited that there's now like quite a wide range of resources that that are available to people so i would very much encourage um, people to maybe start with rust by example and then um, move to exorcism and if that doesn't work then you know maybe pick up some um, some other resources or um, find someone uh, you know go and find a an open source package that people have produced that is you know and try and extend one little piece and and just do things little by uh, you know in small pieces i think is um and eventually, yeah, you will get to exercise 40 and you will understand. <laughs> Great. Uh, in the meantime, questions are dropping in. Okay. So, um, Matt, thanks you for the great presentation. Um, and as a soon-to-be graduate, graduate person, um, they are wondering uh, what it needs to be to, to be known in a technical interview when to apply for junior Rust developer position. So... Mm. I am not going to be able to answer a very good. So the kinds of questions that I would ask if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to, like, what was the difference between result and option? Uh, would be a question that I would ask because um, because the because they seem very very similar, particular at first. Um, if you if I was asking. Um, a more advanced question like sort of you know they understood that i would then ask like what is uh, null pointer optimization this is this is again not super junior role maybe this is just trying to understand like what level someone is at um and what is the null pointer optimization and uh like uh why is it that option like oh, actually no a, a different question would be like how is option represented in memory uh because if you have an understanding of the internals of how Rust works, um, that would say to me that you are inquisitive and that you are um, uh, the kind of person who would look under the surface, um, which I think is really interesting. Some other things that I would um, want to know is how to access values from particular, like the difference between accessing like field, um, uh, uh, like like if I between tuples and structures, for example, or um, uh, I might ask like, when would you like, why would you use like a type alias versus the new type pattern might be in a question that I would, would conceivably ask. But um, uh, unfortunately I am no longer a junior Rust programmer. And so I don't know <laughs> what, <laughs> I don't know what junior Rust programmers encounter. Um, but I will continue to ask, um, I'll continue to think if people are interested, um, I will pop, I'm actually a member of the Rust Lens um, Discord. Um, and so I will, um, I'll see if I can um, follow up that conversation afterwards. Cool. Yeah, the, the Discord is already uh, uh, filling with links and, and comments. So um, th thanks for that answer. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure they appreciate you joining afterwards. A couple of more, more questions, if, if you have the time, if that's okay for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't, I'm apologize to JT, cool. who's probably sitting and waiting. <laughs> <laughs> JT's fine. I, th I think he's a, they are okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so another question coming from our Discord, from, from not Matthias, one of, of our first time speakers, uh, uh, one of our, our earliest community members, um, he asks, are there good sources or crates to read code and develop the ability to understand code and get a better intuition about Rust? Oh, I, um, I, I like to find the, um, if one thing that I've enjoyed doing is going into the Rust subreddit or the users Rust users forum and whenever someone posts hi this is my first rust crate you'll normally can you please provide any suggestions 
you will normally have about 30 people saying, oh, th there's something that you should try. <laughs> there's, should, there's something that you should change. Um, now, uh, it may sound silly, but those small examples or people's first um, people's first crate are really good uh, be, are really good at way, uh, projects to investigate because they are small enough to understand. Uh, if I I'm not going to suggest that you go and dig into the Rust compiler. Um, I will though suggest if you want to understand idiomatic Rust, the Rust standard library is um, very very readable. Um, at least that's been my view, and I'm slightly biased because I've been exposed to Rust for about six years mm. now. But um, but the standard library, uh, and actually there are several. Yeah, the standard library I think was be for sort of good Rust, um, but in terms of if you are new, um, stick with your group and uh, try and improve each other's code because the uh, you will develop an understanding for how people at your level achieve those goals um, or the, achieve the outcomes that they want, which is a little bit different. You know, again, we might use things that are inefficient or uh, possibly slow because they'll be three milliseconds slower. Hmm. Um, but that might be that might be easier to understand than um, an advanced Rust um, code base. Um, yeah. I agree. I also tend to, to look more and more into the standard library. And, and I recently um, stumbled upon the matches macro, which, which I never used, um, uh, which I found in actually in, in Rainer's code because we were working right. on a project <laughs> together. And um, I thought, oh, uh, how, how would I implement the matches macro? And it turned yeah, out yeah. My, my idea wasn't that far away from, from what it cool. did actually now. It's, it's a five line piece of code. It's, it's very easy. It's very easy to read. Uh, yeah, and I think job. One of the uh, other things to remember is that the Rust standard library, or you know, let's say some magical crate like uh, like Rip, uh, sorry, like um, Regex, or um, mm. some things that are very very powerful and very well known, or SAD, for example, that are only written by humans. Um, it's just software, yeah. and so again, the the one thing to remember is that you you're welcome to contribute, and uh, the uh, and all of the working groups within within Rust uh, are very accepting of uh, of contributions, and those contributions do not need to be code related. They could be uh, adding examples to documentation. There are so many ways to to um, and so there are so many ways to contribute. And the only thing that I'm worried about is sort of recommending people join working groups is that. Uh, a lot of the contributors to Rust now are paid programmers. They are paid to write, um, they are paid to improve the Rust compiler or Rust, the Rust language. And so I think burnout is a problem to be, or burnout is something to be weird, uh, to be conscious of. And so don't overextend yourself would be another message that I have. Uh, cool. A, a couple of more questions. Uh, um, so, so, uh, there was none in the beginning, but hey, now there there are a couple, and and I want to give them, if, yeah, if that's absolutely. Good, I want no, no, to give no, that's them absolutely perfect. Cool, great. Um, and another Discord user, some some buggy asks, um, in in your opinion, uh, what's the hardest Rust feature to learn? Async ownership traits, something else. Uh, I, well, I I should say I, um, I. I struggle with lifetime annotations when there are multiple lifetimes. I haven't got a strong intuition for being able to, um, when there are multiple lifetimes involved, I'm, I struggle to understand exactly how uh, a particular lifetime variable that I create is, um, like how do I force, like say that this particular borrow I want to have to be lifetime B. Um, now, uh, the other thing is the um, there. Are, I think that would be that's one of the things that I have struggled with. I don't know if, um, but again, unfortunately, I'm. A, I think asynchronous. The, the async is um, 
uh, is difficult. I don't want to say it's difficult. I think because I just have not invested the time to learn async properly. I think um, I am. I must admit, I've been intimidated or confused by this. Like the kind of two ecosystems. One is Tokyo, and then there's um, async standard or async stud. Now I know that's probably unfair, but it does seem. Um, uh, it does seem like there are sort of two sub communities, which um, and and I think that uh, I think that's a, that's confusing to me at least. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. I can see definitely uh, um, that that you recognize Tokyo code when you see it. <laughs> so it, it it kind of feels that this this Tokyo pattern, uh, um, yeah, it's very visible once once you look at, at all the software that's built upon it. Cool. All right. So um, there are a couple of more questions on on your book. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, which I'll, is, I'll... but but this one that's also also related to this talk, I guess, especially on on, on learning. You know, um, well, how did you decide uh, to structure the learning path in your book? Oh, okay. So the um, one of the things that I did was, uh, um, and this is one of the reasons why it took so long, was that. Um, the book is designed to be read linearly and so we only add one extra feature of the language in every new ex in every new project but that is a problem because if you are implementing a cpu emulator from scratch <laughs> which we do in like chapter five um okay, or not chapter a, one. A, like, so <laughs> yeah um uh the uh, or if you want to emulate like a database, which we do um, mm. in chapter seven, like again from scratch, then uh, I needed to adjust all of the examples. Um, I can continue to shake them out and like remove features because um, we hadn't. Uh, I did not want to introduce um, a lot of complexity. So one of the things that I avoided was uh, high order programming. You will find nearly no uh, vertical bars. Um, mm -hmm. in the first 10 chapters of the book. Um, that made things very difficult <laughs> because idiomatic Rust likes to use um, anonymous functions um, or closures um, uh, a lot. The, one of the other things that I did was um, avoid traits. So uh, the instead of creating a very lovely abstraction or a, really, um, a, a nice attractive interface, which we then implement, um, you will find that most of the examples will just use method calls. Uh, some other things that I deliberately, I deliberately have not. Um, it my book does not teach you the whole language. Uh, there are, um, and so that's another thing, another step that was deliberate. For example, there is no asynchronous code in the whole book. Um, partially because it was started before async was um, <laughs> uh, was stabilized, but but actually primarily because the um, uh, the complexity of being able to say um, the complexity of adding another level of how to um, it just it was too much to pack into one chapter. So I had a couple of chapters which which ended up being uh, the first drafts were like over a hundred pages, um, and there's just too much to learn in one go and so um uh the um yeah so so the, the it's it's structured i think the the structure is basically um we start with with numbers we spend a lot of time talking about numbers and then uh we talk about structures and um and then we introduce text data types and uh compound compound data types and then um that's almost all we use uh we try to keep, I try to keep things as simple as possible. Cool, great. Uh, I really I really look forward to your book actually. So this is this is going to be a nice read. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I, I guess I guess people are uh, very interested in, in 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 hearing more from you. So uh, again, a couple of questions on your book. But I want to uh, to end this Q and A session uh, with lots of praise for your talk. So Antonio says. Uh, the motivational part of the talk and of these answers is something really wholesome and helpful uh, uh, to them. So doubling down on thanks for you, Tim. Um, so is... Uh, give me a second. Stuart, Stuart is saying, um, 
they like your philosophical points on learning Rust a lot. So thank you for that as well. And I, I have to agree. So so it gave me a ton of insights. So I finally understand a, a couple of clipping warnings a lot, lot better. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and it was very inspirational, a very nice talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so oh, much my, for being awake so early it's okay. and it's absolutely fine. phoning in I, from um, the future. Yeah, calling no, no, in no, from no, the future. Perfect. Um, I will, um, I'll let, uh, yeah, no, it's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for organizing and I hope to get you to bed before midnight. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, alrighty. So, um, thank you, Tim. My pleasure. Um, tschüss. And tschüss. Bye-bye. Schönen Morgen. Gute Nacht. <laughs> and I want to to switch over to our speaker. So welcome, Chiti. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for being with us. So how are you doing? Uh, what's What's going on at this time of the hour in, in New Zealand? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> People are waking up and going to work. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, today, Chiti. Um, um, we spoke earlier before we started the live stream that that I basically owe a lot of my career to your last decade of, of work. So <laughs> you've been with the TypeScript team from the very early days. Yeah, I joined, I joined Microsoft and worked on the TypeScript team when it was just getting started and uh, worked on that for three and a half years. It was, cool. it was a lot of fun. Cool. And then you went to Mozilla working on Rust? That's right. Yeah, so I went from there, then joined the Rust team and kind of helped them uh, grow the Rust project. I worked on the Rust error messages and the compiler and the wow. uh, the Rust language server as well. Cool. Um, so uh, if you worked on the Rust language server, I guess that the VS Code Rust plugin has a little bit of your, your code. Yeah, the it? first one does. Yeah, the cool. new Rust analyzer, which is much better, I highly recommend. <laughs> Please use that one instead of the original <laughs> Rust language server. You have my official. <laughs> it's quite you good. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, and and one of your latest projects is is New Shell. Yeah, yeah, and we're going I'm, to. Yeah. I'm totally in love with this project. So yeah, um, maybe that's a good introduction. I can kind of. Yeah. Start for start from there. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 really curious on 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 what you're going to show us today. I heard about New Shell on the Changelog podcast a couple of years ago. So mm. so um right, three right. three years ago, is that about right? Just the, just over two years ago. Yeah, right when yeah. We, right when we announced, and they said, yeah. "Hey, would you like and... to be on the podcast?" Like it's really early, but okay. <laughs> But that was a fantastic episode and really caught my attention. So I'm I'm really curious on, on how the project uh, has turned out and and where where it is right now. So Chitty, thanks thanks for being with us. The stage is yours. Thank you. Now I have to make sure I have the right window and present. Cool. Thanks uh, thanks for everyone tuning in, especially at this late hour. Much appreciated. Um, in this talk, I'll be talking about New Shell. Before I talk about what New Shell is, let me just give a tiny bit of backstory. Uh, so Yehuda Katz, who folks coming from different areas may have heard that name a few different ways, which is kind of fun. Yehuda worked on Ruby on Rails 3, works on Ember JS, and also helped create the cargo tool that we use for building the like our Rust projects and getting the dependencies. So uh, Yehuda, who's a friend of mine, was working on, was, was playing around in PowerShell and said, this has some really cool stuff and not a lot of, not enough people use this thing. How can we take some of these ideas and you know continue to grow them, but maybe grow them in a way that makes sense from a Rust perspective? So he started this project on his birthday, called it Object Shell, and uh, we. I was like, "Cool, let's let's go, let's see where this thing goes." I had actually, unbeknownst to him, started my own shell project around the same time. Had different ideas. I wanted to take some of the ergonomics and usability that I wanted to see in a shell, and so we were talking right after he started his project. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. Can we merge? <laughs> He's like, absolutely. So we merged our projects together. 
renamed it new shell, and then I contribute skip and where, and we'll see uh, what those are here in a second. So this is starting, yeah, around May of 2019. And it's the, the ideas, I guess you could say, are almost in reaction to PowerShell, if, if it, that might be fair to say. So if you look at PowerShell, it's very much created from the perspective of someone working in .NET, working in C Sharp, and wanting to expose that functionality to the world. So it's very object-oriented. It has uh, different object types that represent different types of things, so files and services and whatnot, for all these different objects in the system, uses methods, and the variables that it uses are mutable. So everything just kind of follows and flows from how you might design a shell coming from C Sharp. With Yehuda and I both being kind of Rust converts, I guess you could say, at this point, uh, we'd both been using Rust for years. So we, like Tim was saying, as you become more idiomatic in Rust, you begin to use things like iterators all the time. Data becomes separate from the commands, and you use kind of a, a compositional style, a functional compositional style. So we, we wanted to kind of have that in a structured shell perspective. And also because Rust is immutable by default, we wanted new shell to also take this on so that as you're working, it would be easier down the road as we added you know, parallelism and uh, parallel data processing that all of it just works. You don't have to be thinking about what's mutable, what's safe, and this kind of thing. So a lot of it is new shells kind of being born from this idea of a structured shell, but in a much more rust direction. So the, the kind of goals of this, all right, like I was saying, it's it's very data first. Everything is immutable, everything is structured data. As we find out, um, one of the inspirations for it early on is the Surday project. And uh, I think Tim even mentioned Surday in, in his talk. So Surday being the serialization, deserialization system that's quite uh, quite widespread use in Rust has inside of it a kind of universal data structure, a universal value type. And if we can you know, take a bunch of different data sources and create this universal value type, then we can create a bunch of commands that can filter it and a bunch of other commands that can manipulate and use those, this data, present this data. So we are really inspired by Surday's universal data type and said, why can't we just introduce into a shell structured value type? that you can you can build up. And I'm going to show examples here in a minute. But this is kind of the the real foundation for where we started to come to the design of New Shell is looking at Surday and saying, can we apply these uh, to a structured shell? It's ergonomic. My background is in developer tools. Uh, so like we were talking about, I worked on TypeScript. I work on Rust error messages. I really care a lot about if you do something wrong, that we hurt as little as possible. So we present you a very attractive error. We present the system and its data in a very attractive way. So it feels fun. Like you want to use it. You want to pick that up over you know, other tools because it, it really engages with you. It really feels comfortable to use. And as we'll see, it's a structured shell in that as you build the pipeline, you know, in a traditional Unix shell, pipelines take strings and pass strings of text through these pipelines. So you can compose together multiple Unix commands into a much more complex command, but each one has to handle string, like text data rather than structured data going between the different commands. And we wanted to flip that. We wanted by default everything to be structured data in as the, the commands compose. I'll show a little bit of how that works here in a minute. I uh, I saw this tweet the other day, and I said that is a great <laughs> that is a great quote. Feels like having a Jupyter notebook cell embedded in the terminal. Like it, the, <laughs> I'll just let that speak for itself. We'll see if you think that that's the case when I actually show the demo. So let's show the demo. So give me one second, and we'll switch to the demo.
All right. So this is new shell. As you can see, it looks like a normal shell. It looks like bash or fish or any of these other shells. Um, it's got a prompt, and I can type commands. So the first one I'm going to type is just ls. So when I type ls, you can see that it's a table. It's got some columns at the top. And each of these columns is you know, a column of data. You know, For an ls, I get you know, a set of file names, a set of types, size, and modified. If I do a different command, so I might do ps, and that's my list of processes <laughs> for people that want to know what's running on my system. And you can see it's the same kind of idea. We have tabulated data. They have different columns and different values in the different columns. If I want to, for example, now use this, this data, it's not just that I'm printing out a table. Like That would be neat. That would be attractive to just print the table. But this data itself has structure to it. So if I wanted to say where size is greater than like 10 kilobytes, I can take the structured data coming out of ls, pass it into this filter, this where command. And by saying where, I actually down select or filter down to just what matches this. And you can see there's a lot of inspiration for Rust going on behind the scenes. LS is giving me an iterator if you look at the actual implementation. So it's giving me an iterator. And then I'm creating a new iterator using this where command. So I'm just kind of building and building and building until I get an iterator that I pull on at the end. And as I pull on that data, I have the elements that match all of the, all of the different stages of that iterator. This where command is working on this universal data value type. So if I said ps, and we'll we'll bring ps up. If I want to say ps where, let's see what our column names are here at the top. And let's say where mim is greater than some certain size. We could say ps where mim is greater than, let's say, 10 megabytes. Oh, here's an example of me mistyping something. So it says, hey, you created a string here, and this is a file size. So 10 MV it gets turned into a string because it's not, it's not a value. But that is, so if I say 10 megabytes, then I'm actually filtering down the processes to those that are larger than 10 megabytes in size. Let me show one other example real quick. If I do open cargo.toml, which is something that we do quite a lot, um, opening data files like TOML files and XML files, JSON files, themselves also give us tabulated data. You'll notice that in some cases, like with listing a directory or listing the file entries, that's all you know nice and flat columns. Here we have data structured inside of other data. So this is how we handle uh, something that's more like a tree or more like a, uh, a more complex uh, data structure. And then I can, of course, do the same thing. Like if I wanted to uh, run a command over top of the structured data, maybe I want to get out bin and see all the binaries that new ships with. And so here we go. So it ships with a bunch of plugins. And then I can continue to manipulate it. Notice like as I'm building it up, I have a set of commands that are generating the data that I'm working with, a set of commands that are filtering that data. And as a user, I just have to learn what you might say, like M plus N, like M number of commands that can generate N commands that can filter. And as I build my, voc my vocabulary, I can reuse it everywhere because we're just using one value type, one under underneath. It's like an iterator of this value type then I can just use the same, the same set of commands regardless of where this data is coming from. All right. So let's see. I'm kind of sucking through my notes. Oh, yeah. And this is, this is something that I kind of mentioned in the early slides. This is, these aren't objects. This is just like real structured data. Um, they don't have methods on them. We don't mutate them or anything like that but we just build up the, the pipelines. The next thing that I want to do is to make, let's build up 
a command of our own. So I'm going to say, let's, let's make one called largest. It's going to take, and you notice it's highlighting red because it's telling me, hey, this is an incomplete, this is an incomplete command. There are parts, major parts of this thing missing. You need to make sure that you at least uh, provide these parts. So we'll say the largest X or like count, the, the largest number of files in a directory, and we'll give it a count for the number of files we want. So we'll list the directory, and then we'll say we'll sort by the size. And then from there, we'll grab, like say, the, the last count. All right. So if I say largest three, I'll get the top three. If I say largest five, I'll get the top five, and so on. This um, this definition now is has contributed a new command into the system. And now it interacts with everything else. So if I say largest five, I notice, hey, there's some directories in here. So I can say, well, where type is not directory. And then I can filter it more. So it's not that at any point we're printing out the table. You can think of it more that this whole thing runs. And what, what comes out of this pipeline is again an iterator, and we only see the the values on the screen when the very last stage happens, and that's called auto viewing. It's going to take that iterator and then finally show you the contents of that iterator on the screen. All right. So this is the largest. We get the values out. Oh, one other thing I want to show here as well is that you know coming from TypeScript and coming from uh, gradually type systems like TypeScript, being able to put in type information, uh, we can do this here as well. So I can say that this count is an int when it comes in. And if I try to say something that is not OK, so I say foo, it says, hey, you said that it was going to take an int, and instead you gave it a string. And so you can't do that. This you know, kind of light type checking and how you can build up commands then allows you to more easily scale this up to writing full scripts. And there are people that have taken New Shell and used it for doing much larger uh, data processing systems. Or I say large, I mean large for a project that is still very much in its infancy. So they've got you know many files and, and a lot of New Shell source for just doing different kinds of data processing. OK, so we can do optional types. I did show error messages. I think one of the ways to think about New Shell is that it's an IDE in the terminal in some ways. So we've got completions. If I start typing largest, I can get a completion for that. If I say new dot, um, new is a dot, uh, dollar sign new is the built-in variable that gives you access to some things like your, like your history path. And you can see, OK, this is where my history is being stored. So we have some of the, the completion logic, and we're building a bunch of new completion logic as well, so that it feels, again, more like a very nice shell, like fish, or like even like being in an IDE in your terminal. <laughs> uh, OK, I have to show this real quick. <laughs> I didn't prep my, my emojis. <laughs> I made this note. I, I, I made this as a tweet the other day that you can say, um, let shark equals five. And then you can echo shark <laughs> and get five out. So the, the parser is very, um, it's very powerful. It's very flexible. And in, actually, I want to take one second to explain some of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. And I'll leave maybe some for questions or, or chatting on the Discord. But I want to take you through how the parser in New Shell works. So for example, if I try to do, let, let me do that where again. And ask the system about where. I can say, help, where? And it will give me some examples here at the bottom. You can see 
And at the top, it tells me what the parameters are to where. Notice that here, where has a single parameter called condition. And if you look back at the top, it's a, it almost seems like if you implemented this as on um, day one, you might take three parameters to where and then just kind of make it work. But what's actually happening in new shell is that it sees a single parameter. It sees that the type is condition. And then as the parser parses, it configures itself. It says, I expect a condition in this position. So these uh, three size greater than 10 kilobytes become a single thing that the parser then gets configured to look for. What's actually happening is that once it's parsed, so it kind of switches into a mode that can pass mathematical expressions. And then what comes out looks like, let me just write this up, where uh, I'll do the full thing, where it, then it got size greater than 10 kilobytes, right? So it kind of looks like this. It expands that smaller expression that's easier to read, easier to write, but it expands it into a full expression. And here we can see some of the, the bars that uh, Tim was talking about. So you can see Rust shining through in certain places, but here we have a block. It has a single parameter called it, and it is the name of each of the rows. You can think of it as iteration. So as you go through each row, you can access the, uh, the column and its data and then compare it to something else. So this kind of type directed parsing is something that I have not seen in very many languages, if at all. Uh, it's been research, kind of a research topic back when I was in grad school for programming languages. It was a research topic then. So that's, you know, back in 20, 2011, 2012, and really hasn't really made its way out. And in a shell like this, we have such flexibility because there's already a sense of what does it mean to pass arguments into a command. And it gives us a lot of flexibility to say, all right, let's make macros or type directed parsing part of this so that it gives you a much nicer syntax as a result. So I want to just talk about that quickly. You can kind of see if you're learning iterators where the iterators actually show through here. One last thing that I wanted to show off in terms of um, kind of features is one that we just recently added. I'm really excited about it. So let me go see if I can find my example. You can see I've got, I, this is from the New Zealand uh, census data. I've got a 123 meg CSV file, and I'm going to load this thing. You can see I've, I've pulled this up before. If I load this, <laughs> right directory. I'm going to load this 123 meg CSV file, and it takes you know a couple of seconds and can load it up. And then from here, the same kinds of things um, that you can do with different data sources we can do here, but using data frames. And if you're not familiar with Pandas or data frames, this idea that these columns of data can be stored in really efficient ways. So we can do operations on this uh, really efficiently. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a variable. Say let df equals this thing. And then I will do data frame group by. And the group that we're going to group by is years. So we're going to group all the years together and then work over each of the years. All right, so we'll let that load. And it'll, it'll do the little group by for us. And now we can start to process this. So if we wanted to say data frame uh, aggregate and the max of each year. You can see once it's loaded, I'm processing 5 million records in aggregate, like in a blink of an eye. So this is using some really powerful, really new uh, technology called Apache Arrow and a crate called Polars. And I'm really excited to see this work uh, become part of New Shell, become part of 
you know, right now, everything you have to say data frame and then something else, but we're looking at integrating this more into new shell itself so that I can, if I'm just opening a CSV file and then I'm just doing where over different data sources underneath, we're using the fastest, strongest architecture and engine to process that data for you. So it, you, it almost opens up doors that you're not used to having open in a shell anymore. It feels like we're stretching beyond a lot of what's common in a shell. And I'm, I'm really excited to explore that, that space. All right, let me quickly switch back to my, my original slides. And great. All right, Oop, wrong one. There we go. So that was kind of a demo, a little taste. Uh, incidentally, I tried to open that same file in LibreOffice. <laughs> it's like no, it gave up. It's too many rows. So I, I think it's really cool to, to have it in the system to be able to have the flexibility to work with any size of data and to not have to worry about it. If you're curious about NewShell, so we've got the NewShell website, newshell.sh. You can, of course, go to the repo. We have a Discord. If you go to the repo, you'll see the Discord link in there as well. It's a pretty active Discord. If you have ideas or if you want to try it out and just share your experience, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, and Discord's a really great place to reach out and talk to us. Another one that I wanted to mention, uh, Michael's actually in the Discord right now as uh, Dashel. So Michael and his, the team at Couchbase are working on an extension to New Shell that takes New Shell and extends it with Couchbase functionality. Uh, he can kind of talk more about the experience there, but it's been really great working with them and seeing New Shell used from different points of view and from different areas to really help stretch it and grow it in a way that it, it kind of solves more solutions than the initial ones. So yeah, that's a lot of fun to, to see that take off. And yeah. Any questions? All right, uh, uh, TT. Wow, that's so amazing. Uh, um, yeah, you hit me at LS. <laughs> <laughs> Though the moment I was seeing the tabular data, I was like, oh, finally. But from then on, it just evolved into something absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So, so, wow, uh, uh, that that uh, that. I still have to process what I what I've been seeing, but that's that's pretty amazing, and I guess I guess the audience uh, agrees as well. There are a couple of questions, so oh, um, so before we go to the question, uh, Tim has a nice uh, nice comment. <laughs> what Polar's inside new shell? That's amazing. <laughs> um, so. Um, Arthur, also one of our of our um, earlier um, community members. Um, wants to ask, I, I don't know if the, the question has been answered already during the course of your presentation because that was right at the beginning. Uh, wants to ask if you if you can explain the major difference between the iron shell and new shell. I don't know about the iron shell. I, I, I think I think you that is the iron shell the one that is the shell for Redox, I believe. I can't remember. Um, yeah, a lot of the differences in the shell is that new shell is really stretching into being any place that you need to connect to data in your system, you see it in a structured way. So it's philosophically really different from a lot of other shells, but to use it, to feel it, to touch it and to use it, it I want it to be as good to use as something like fish. So you could just drop it in, use it like fish if you don't use the structure, but it's there if you need it you can really drop in and, and dig deep. Cool. So um, Arthur just says that uh, yes, it is the default shell for Redux, and I guess I guess the question was was answered. Um, somebody from our chat asks: Are there flags for filters like mm. sort order, sort by, and how can they find the flags for those filters? Yeah, if you do help space and then the name of the command or the name of the command and dash h or dash dash help. Uh, you'll get the, the automatically generated documentation. So underneath, each command implements a trait. <laughs> we get to talk about all the Rust stuff that uh, Tim was talking about. So they implement a trait, and the trait 
as they implement the different parts of the trait, we build the help from what they've they've implemented. And so it generates the examples. That's why the examples are colored, is that they mm -hmm. get back the code, the new shell parser parses it, and then colorizes it, puts it on the screen. So um, there are some flags for things like sort by. You can do reverse sorting, for example. But one of the, I, had, I didn't put this in my slide deck. It's a it's tiny bit mean, which is why I didn't do it. Uh, someone went and counted all the flags for all the various POSIX commands for today and saw like over the years how many flags are in each of those commands. And we really want to uh, limit, if you will, like mm -hmm. get down mm -hmm. to just the minimum number of flags because composability and thinking in a vocabulary is much stronger than okay, what is the flag on this particular function and how is that different than this other command and mm -hmm. so on. Cool. Cool. Um, Kushi Kim, uh, I don't know if, again, I'm sorry if, if I butchered if I butchered the name, um, but has another question. Um, does the renderer, so the, the final output, also support other types, like if one column um, is an image, would it be possible to render that image? I love this question. Uh, New Shell right now lives in the terminal, but we also do have a Jupyter version of New Shell. So you can be interacting with the same commands, but in a more visual, um, more graphical way. And I think as New Shell matures, we want to stretch up and out of terminal. So we'll always have terminal. You'll always be able to have an interactive terminal. But what that means uh, I really want to kind of stretch that because if you're interacting with data, you might pull up in different files. Incidentally, if you install New Shell today and you open a PNG file, we will draw the PNG file for you in the terminal, um, just as a, a fun a fun little trick that we did. But if you actually do want to use New Shell for like listing a directory and then seeing a little uh, thumbnail for each, that's totally something that as we build towards a graphical kind of the text and the graphical version of New Shell. In the graphical, that would be fair game. I would love something like that. Cool. Um, Kim also agrees that it's a mind-blowing piece of work. So much appreciated. Uh, and, and I have to I have to agree. Uh, one more question from from Tim. Um, how does Tim teach New Shell about custom file types? <laughs> um so some of that is just going to be jumping into the code base and uh, adding them. <laughs> um, New Shell, I didn't actually mention this, and you know, bad on me. New Shell is cross-platform, so it works the same in Linux and Windows, Mac OS, when, uh, even WebAssembly. So you can compile it and use it in whatever platform that you're you're using it. Um, you're kind of working in, and we very much want to. Do the best support in each of those platforms. So if there if there are custom file types, um, if there are you know little bits of metadata, there are ways to tag metadata on your on your bits of data. But I think yeah, I would love to kind of continue to stretch and get the best support on each of the platforms. Cool, cool. Um, um, I guess. That's all the questions we had for today. There's lots of, of activity in the chat. Um, Dashiell um, is, is posting a lot of help, a lot of, of links, which is very great. So, so uh, um, thanks, thanks for that. Thanks, GT, for your wonderful presentation. I, you know, uh, um, what I heard in the podcast is, is something totally different. If you see it live, that's <laughs> just that's just mind blowing. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to install a uh, new shell right away. So, so definitely, this is something that I want to try out. Um, awesome. So thank you very much for, for coming today. Thank you very much for getting up so early and, and joining our little meetup. Um, and I want to bring Tim again also to the stage for a final goodbye. So people from the future, thank you so much <laughs> for joining us. Um, it's it's great that that um, the ways of the pandemic at least made it possible that we can spend a couple of hours of, of time gap to to meet virtually. Uh, maybe it's possible to meet sometime in the future. That would be great. Um, maybe when conferences are a real thing again and traveling across huge distances is something that that works again. Um, but until then, uh, let's let's stay in touch and thank you again the both of you for being with us. This was a fantastic evening. 
a fantastic night, a fantastic morning, or a fantastic wherever you are from right now <laughs> and, and tuning in. So, um, well, goodbye and see you. Oh, see wonderful. You in the Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Bye bye.